and, and sink this lifeboat to try to jack up Mexico. See, that's why I was against the killing of Gaddafi and putting in Al-Qaeda to make it 10 times worse on record now. To admit it, it's a total hellhole. Because Gaddafi was probably a bad guy 35 years ago when he took power. But he did spend about 98% of the money that he controlled. Only time socialism works is if you do have a beneficent dictator in an already hellish anarchy area who builds public works and actually gives the general public jobs and builds colleges. And Gaddafi lived in a tent most of the time. And if you saw his so-called armored palace for his, quote, safety, it was a 15-foot wall and what looks like a swimming pool that wouldn't be that fancy in Westlake, Austin. And I'm not lionizing him or glorifying him. He got totally delusional, started meeting with Obama six years ago, meeting with Sarkozy. Uh, well, I say six years before he was killed. It's about nine years ago now. And he started investing their money in Goldman Sachs and sort of going to meetings in Europe and actually believed because he was able to meet with Davos people and Bilderberg people that, that he was working with the West. He gave up all his weapons, his high-tech weapons, nerve gas, you name it, and you saw what happened to him. And Gaddafi was literally jacking up out of the mud 80% of Africa. He was building that continent up and literally, for whatever reason, was taking not just the money from in Libya, but he was doing true development all over Africa. And he was trying to form an African union not run by the globalists. They're trying to set that up too, to have one enslavement system. He was setting up a real African union where the countries really voted, they really elected people, and they really came together. And man, Africa is a beautiful country. I would love, I get chills when I talk about this. I believe in humanity. I want to empower humanity. I want to see Africa that's a jewel with the resources and, and the beauty and the people. But corruption has been in control of Africa forever. They never got out of it. Everywhere else was under corruption. The exact same executions, torture, slavery, barbarism went on in Mesoamerica, went on in Europe, went on in Asia, went on everywhere. Until the Renaissance, ladies and gentlemen, and until the ideas of Christendom merge with the Renaissance, because Christendom had its own dark age and its own problems, and out of that came what we see as Western civilization that is in total retreat and decline right now, being replaced by the technocracy, eugenicist, scientific dictatorship system that I stand firmly against. But I also, at a fundamental gut organic level, you can call it a spiritual level, realize that if I have a greedy thought to suppress someone at my advancement, an evil thought, that it will only come back on society and on myself. I call that God-fearing. It's an instinct that you reap what you sow. It's a fact of the universe. It's a law, even if you don't believe in spiritual forces. It's real. And so just because they've set up a system where the minority groups are hyped and ready for tribalism and racism doesn't mean that I have to buy into that and hate them. It doesn't mean, though, that I don't put up defenses and speak directly to people and say, look, here's how the game works. And it doesn't mean a group of Klansmen trying to kill some old black man walking down the road aren't a threat to him but it isn't an expression of white people. Just like a group of blacks, which is much more common now, just like Klansmen of old attacking whites and killing them brutally because they're dehumanized animals in their eyes, tit for tat. Just like I personally don't want to do it, but if a group of black young racist tries to beat me and my family to death, I'll just shoot them. Just like a black man should shoot a group of Klansmen trying to lynch him. But it doesn't mean I kill them with pleasure. It doesn't mean that it's something I enjoy. It's something I've got to do. And I'm going to stop preaching and mention the headlines when we come back that are huge. But Obama is saying, wink, wink, I'm going to deport you. Wink, wink, don't come up here. As he gives awards to illegal alien children two days ago at the Dream Act ceremony. And as the word goes out, bring it on. We're going to collapse the U.S. into the North American Union 
as General Petraeus said in the London Telegraph yesterday, and David Knight covered on the nightly news last night. We'll give the number out when we come back, take a lot of your calls, and Bob Barr's coming up and more. Aaron, who went out to break with that, and he went, what is that? An ice cream truck? <laughs> that interview's out there. Willie Nelson said, I knew your show was big, but I had no idea it was so big. Yeah, I get a lot of death threats when I come on. <laughs> My family tells me not to come on, but we need to talk about what's going on. That movie Endgame, what a world, folks. All right, here's the deal. I want to open the phones up for first-time callers on this Friday, specifically on any issue you wish to discuss. But I would like to hear your take if you are predisposed, about Obama saying, you know what, you don't send your kids up here because you can send them, but we're going to deport them. When it's on record, they've almost ended all the deportations, even of aggravated felons. And we've got video, we're going to play it in a moment again, of the Border Patrol with buses coming in, letting the kids get off, not even checking who they are, and letting them get in vans and drive off. And then we have the emergency manager saying the feds, he's told, give them the, the Greyhound tickets or vouchers, and that most of them, when they get off at his city, already have them from the Border Patrol. We got the guy's name and everything. And then we have the federal purchase order back from January saying prepare for kids in Texas to be shipped into the U.S. to their families who are illegals. And Senator Ted Cruz yesterday had a chance to ask a few questions of Jay Johnson, who we are sending reporters today to where he's having a press conference. But it, it's just classic create a crisis, offer the solution. And I've got in the stack all over the news, but in my stack, they've got three mainstream articles going by Republicans going, isn't it time for amnesty? You don't like Obama having it by fiat, do you? Totally open borders. Better give them what they want. It's good for us. They've already legalized the illegals by fiat. And under this amnesty, it lets everybody here who is the illegal stay and bring in their families. So it's just as bad as this. It's the same thing. But they're saying, we don't care if Congress won't pass what we want. We'll do it by fiat, which is called dictatorship. I mean, this is such a sensational time to be alive. I don't use the word sensational in a good way. I mean, I've seen a few fatal, sensational car wrecks. I told the story of people racing a Corvette and a um, Z28, I think it was, down the I-30 bridge from Rockwall to Rowlett. And when I was in a truck, like 14, with my buddy driving. We were driving into Rowlett to pick up some girls on a Saturday afternoon and take them to a movie. And needless to say, we didn't make the movie. And two guys we knew from high school shoot past us going about 130 in medium traffic. And that Corvette almost hits two cars, cuts in front, and has a blowout. And stands up on its nose, spinning. But there was a railroad trestle on the side with some grass. Most of it was open to the water, or everybody would have died. And I saw that Corvette go spinning and then just exploding with gasoline and people flying around. This is about 150 yards ahead of us. They shoot by us, turn, blow up. I see the car disintegrate, get out, run over, blood spraying out of people's necks the whole nine yards. And I don't tell that story to be macabre. I tell that story because I run into people that get a cut on their finger and they almost pass out and they freak out. And I wonder, my God, what are they going to do in life when they get cancer or when their kid runs through a you know plate glass window in front of them or when they get a compound fracture. I mean, I just, that's why I found working with veterans and military people so good. The media says they're horrible and don't hire them and they're devils and may kill you any minute is that they just don't think little stuff's a big deal. And they're usually can do people because they've already seen so much real stuff. And, and then I saw an, another fatal accident one time with little kids because it happened about 500 yards ahead of me so I stopped and pulled over and had to be there for a while and it was just little dead kids all over the place so minivan and, and I just so when I say sensational 
when I say spectacular, ladies and gentlemen. But it's things like that that give us character. Not that it's a good thing. It just changes you. You know, like watching your grandfather die and take their last breath. Things like that has fundamental effects. And so many people are living in the false reality of their iPhones. They have no idea the real world's going on all around them. We'll be right back. We're on the march. The Empire's on the run.